and sharing the settings uh, can be a little difficult, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just speak a little bit. So I'm Karim Jani. I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, I've been in, uh, in a lot of different industries, mainly finance and insurance, banking, logistics, and um, <clears throat> built a lot of client facing systems, a lot of internal systems. And uh, how we got into IoT is really the next generation of devices that we've been seeing. I mean, the late in late 2000s, we've seen a major increase of cell phone usage, and then internet became very, very, uh, um, very broadly used. And all of a sudden, we started putting chips everywhere, and and that's kind of uh, where the development, my development, that took us uh, as a company. Advancio started about in we started Advancio about 2010, uh, mainly doing custom software development, helping companies find the right talent to be able to develop their 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 projects and help them helping them with their growth plans and and getting some rid of some their backlog. Uh, traditionally, we started with the the portals, the the mobile apps, and then naturally you grow into APIs and data exchanges, and the next thing you know, you're doing things on devices. Uh, but I guess uh, similar to Voller, the most important thing about anything is the data. And, and all of a sudden data became very, um, very coveted and, and very valuable. And now there's a lot of companies that, that are valued based on the data assets they have. So we kind of naturally switched into that uh, mode and we started doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of data work. And IoT is one of the uh, primary source of data that we have today. Uh, <clears throat> so in general, um, that's kind of just a brief of myself, Advancio, how we got into IoT and, um, and before we can start talking about IoTs in general. And while please feel free to do a, um, a give and take, I like, I like the, the asking the questions and answering uh, more than just presenting. So feel free to interrupt me or ask me any questions you want uh, if, if you have those. Well, the... the... Audience can ask questions. The best is to send them on chat, and then I can interrupt you. Or uh, we even—it's a small enough audience. I think people can simply turn on their microphone and, and speak up. All right. All right. So, so we'll start a little bit about um, <clears throat> the IoT and and the Internet of Things in general. Um, like I mentioned earlier, in the late in the late two thousands. We started seeing a lot of uh, mobile devices now became very, very popular at that point. You know, cell phones have screens now and uh, Android came into place and it made that accessible to a lot of people. Uh, broadband now we're talking about everybody has internet on their phone. Yes, at the beginning it was limited. I remember when we all had like 500 megs of, of data and, and now we're seeing like it's normal for us to have gigs and terabytes of data, limited data. So that accessibility to the internet has really encouraged a lot of companies to start putting, um, collecting data pretty much for all aspects of their lives. Um, talking about logistics companies putting chips on their trucks to locate uh, where they are first, just GPS. And then next thing you know, they're trying to find out uh, what the fuel consumption is or the what, what the, any kind of consumables are on that truck um, the best and then they start using that data live in order to to take immediate action on on the best route to take or the most efficient one next thing you know you have all this collection of data that you've been collecting collecting from all these uh, devices and now you need to analyze it right? it's, it, it goes from the tactical of day-to-day -day stuff to the strategic what do i do with this mine of data that i have on my business uh, in order for me to make better decisions for the future. Then like, like anything else, technology is expensive at the beginning, but the more adoption takes place, the cheaper it gets. And next thing you know, we're starting to see chips into our phone, into our TVs, and we're seeing them into our fridges. And, and then it goes to you know these things, wearable devices where, and now not only it tracks uh, the time for you, but it tracks uh, where you are, what you're listening to, you where your heartbeat, and and 
IoT has become part of our lives. Uh, since the introduction of the very first IoTs that we ever had was basically our, that we all had accessible accessibility to was, was cell phones. So, so that's kind of the evolution of IoT and how we got to where it is today, which is very, very uh, readily available to everybody um, and used in different and different uh, industries and households. And, and that's not even to mention, like if I talk about what, what it's used for, I mean, you see IoT devices everywhere, talking about smart watches, you know, your thermostat, your security system, even, even you know, the little earbuds that we put in our ears, they're not just for, they're not just for, for listening to your, to your music, but it actually it keeps track of the charge level, how long you've listened, your decibel level, the amount of data that it puts back and forth between the ear piece and your phone is, is unbelievable. And all that data is being, is being stored somewhere and analyzed somewhere. And in the industrial side, uh, we're talking about uh, manufacturing like machinery, machine to machine robots. Um, you're talking about smart cities. Um, you know, we all are very familiar nowadays with the uh, parking structure with the green and red lights on top of the spots. Now, all that was not available in the past, but now it's, it's, it's almost like you go to a parking structure that doesn't have that and you kind of don't want to go in. Um, so it's, it's literally changing the way of lives, fitness, healthcare, like it's, it's in every, every domain. And, uh, and the good thing about this, and if we take it a little bit from a, from a technical perspective, right? How do we get here? Well, through the adoption, and then what are we, where is it going? Well, wide adoption requires talent to build this stuff. It requires resources to, to store this stuff, it requires um, power to analyze this stuff. So now IoT, which was originally just very expensive niche just to solve a business need, is now wildly spread, widely used, accessible to everybody. So, it, so it, their market is there for, for people to get developed in knowing how to handle these devices, how to program these devices, how to take advantage of the data generated by these devices. And then you have a whole career that's developing now because of this. You have data scientists now that have more work than ever because of the data that's already available. <clears throat> and, and the just to talk a little bit about the technology base and the languages, I'll get a little bit geeky here and, and please stop me if I'm getting a little too geeky. Um, things like cell phones, mobile devices. Um, it's very easy to start programming on, on, on Java or Xcode for, for, for um, iOS devices. But then if, if you'd like really for, for students and, and professionals who like physical hardware and not necessarily deal with phones, you, know, you have very affordable chips like uh, Raspberry Pi or Arduino that you know, using Python or, or C, you can, you can easily program something that, that makes a difference, that sends data back and forth, that communicates with sensors, um, that is uh, internet connected, that grabs data and analyzes it on the spot. Some of these chips are so advanced now that they run, they run AI alg algorithms on the chip, making, making the, the IoT now AIoT, which is artificial intelligence, intelligence thing. So, so it's it's moving the bar for us uh, from a what you can do with the technology, but lowering the bar of entry for people who want to get into the technology because now it's more commoditized. It's not as commoditized as the rest as as the basic languages, but but it's getting there, right? So, so and that's all we should hope for is really making it accessible for newcomers to be able to to jump in. And, and, and that's not that difficult nowadays because um, there's nobody needs to start a project from scratch. So for those people who are newcomers to the industry and they're really thinking, well, I don't know, um, I would like to experiment with IoT, but I don't know where to begin. Well, just like any other development framework, there's always boilerplates, there's always sample projects, there's always uh, open source libraries that you can download and start playing with. 
And it depends on the project that you're working on. A lot of, for a lot of times, all you need is a small MVP to try to prove a concept. And if that's the case, then yeah, you can just pick up a small boilerplate and, and run with it and have fun with it. If, if you're more for, for companies that are probably that IOT is part of their core business and, and they're building um, IP based on whatever they're developing, then yeah, maybe for those companies, they probably need a little bit more expertise where they need to jump in the, uh, the architecture of thing, what's the devices and the sensors, where they get be connected to cloud on-premise, what's gonna be analyzing them, what data is supposed to not only send, but receive. And that is hard to get in a board of play. That's something that you'll need an architect, you'll need a, a, a senior developer, you need a designer, you need a DevOps person. It's a whole project, like software development life cycle that you gotta go through in order mm -hmm. to, to get that done. Yes. We have a question. Yeah. Uh, what are the most popular gadgets at our disposal that we should be thinking of doing something with? Well, definitely um, the, the chips I mentioned, Arduino and Raspberry Pi, they're very, very accessible. And then there is sensors that you can buy that plug into these to get. So you're talking about temperature sensors, sound sensors, light sensors, uh, gesture sensors. You can connect all these things to these machines and to these chips, and you can program whatever logic you want in order to, to, to analyze that data or store it or send it or do whatever you need to do with it because it, it's the, the chip already comes pre-wired with Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi uh, antennas and, and everything you need to kind of just be able to communicate. Now, what about people that are not programmers and they want to take an off the shelf gadget and collect data from that? What, what, what would you, what kind of gadgets uh, would you think of there? Well, it's, um, if you're not- oh, a and, and find, I'm sorry, there's a follow-up. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Google and Apple using mobility reports to provide insight about COVID-19? I guess that, that's a different question. Uh, it's better to finish the first one first. <laughs> but other gadgets don't require programming. Uh, other gadgets, so so it's, for regular users, they have gadgets, they add the book disposal like uh you have access to your watch and your watch you can set it to continuously monitor your heartbeat and your oxygen level um if you need access to that and you don't know programming i mean you can usually it's connected to google fit if it's a google or, or whatever it is mobvoi if you're using a tech watch or apple help if you're using apple and, and you can export that data um on a csv format and upload it wherever you need to upload it so it's it's if you're not a programmer it's going to be more of a manual thing uh, and you have to go with what's off the shelf. But also, if you're not a programmer, um, there are some languages like Python that are not very difficult to learn. And, and if you learn that, then you can probably venture into something like a Raspberry Pi and start doing things with custom gadgets, not just what's available to you off the shelf. Okay. So uh, shall I repeat the question about COVID-19? Yeah. Yeah, what do I think about it? Uh, uh, first of all, I think it's a very, it's, are we going to get into a whole different level? Uh, <laughs> that's another topic that I was, I was. You, you can avoid the politics. <laughs> yeah, I can avoid the politics. I really think that it shows the power of technology and communication that we have gotten to today. Being able to detect with my consent, supposedly, or of course, however, whatever I you're in, with my with my content with my consent, I'm able to um, broadcast a beacon and be able to get somebody else's beacon and know if I've been within proximity of somebody else. I think that's pretty fascinating, and quite frankly, it's it's astonishing and amazing. Uh, now, the I wouldn't say the political, but the the actual uh, yeah, and the political view of that is is no different than any new technology that comes into place. And you're always gonna stumble on legislation that has to follow up with this stuff. The COVID was kind of a, a pandemic that we all had to react. And, and a lot of decisions have been made to preserve lives without giving it a lot of thought. And I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm just saying that they were made fast and hastily. Um, hastily can i imply something no they were just made fast 
Okay, I'm not trying to imply anything. But then you have other industries that have been there for a while. I'll give you an example, for example, uh, the insurance industry. Um, you've, traditionally, the insurance industry has really relied on statistical data to know the patterns of uh, the drivers, for example, auto insurance. Uh, they really rely on statistical data to rely on the pattern of the profiles of the drivers based on number of incidents they have or based on their age, their gender, uh, the zip code where they live. And they took all that data, they analyzed it, they came up with a rate, and that's the rate you got to pay, right? But today with IoT now, we have insurance companies that would install an app on your phone and as long as you're driving, it tracks how many miles you drive, how fast you drive, how, how fast you accelerate, how, how abruptly you brake. And now it creates all this wealth of information about a driver profile that we didn't have before that is definitely more accurate about your driving habits and more accurate about your risk. But is, again, the legislator has to come into play. This is like, this is not due to the pandemic. This has been happening for a while. But what does the legislator do? Do they change the insurance rate filing to adapt to these new data points that are being collected and have a more customized rate for every person? Or do they stick their gun and then continue doing it the old way because uh, the innovators are so little that are using these IoT data and getting data and it's not worth the legislator's time or effort to spend time to kind of decide whether they want to even consider this or not. So I think just like anything else, technology advances faster than politics and, and it takes time for politics to catch up. And COVID-19 is just another way of, we've seen that happen. So I guess I didn't answer the question of what oh, I think, I guess. I, yeah, I think you did. <laughs> oh. Uh, we have another question. As a CEO of a company that wishes to start in this industry, wait. Yeah, are there any tips to detect a problem that could be resolved with IoT? Um, that's uh, a pretty open question. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, the companies that pioneered IoT needed it. They saw a need for it, and it's thanks to them that IoT is cheap today. Um, but because it's available today and accessible to all companies, um, in my opinion, there's probably two, maybe, but mainly two things, two reasons why companies should consider IoT. Um, the first one is understanding real time how their business is doing and being to adjust real time uh, the actions need, that need to be taken. For example, we talked about Logistics companies, let's take an example of FedEx or Uber or these companies that need to transport things and they have to immediately find out the best route, so the, who to pick up where from where and then the, how, the, how traffic is on the street. All that is IoT. Um, so if, if you need to make live decisions on routing, then yeah, IoT is definitely important for you. If you have a data warehouse and is it constantly keeps getting unorganized, then yeah, maybe you should invest in IoT. Like you've seen those modern data warehouses, they don't, they just pile things wherever they pile it and robots go and pick them up. They don't really have like pallets and numbers and you have this category here and this category. That's the new modern, the modern warehouse now is robot driven. So you don't, I, it's all IoT. The second reason to use IoT is for if you want to, on the same topic of analyzing the data, day, getting every single data point and metric from your business process is being able to analyze it long-term and being able to have some kind of predictive actions and predictive analytics and, 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 and put strategic actions, um, strategic plans based on historical data and predictive data. Um, then at that point, you absolutely need data points in everything that you even think uh, could be helpful. Like for example, if I have if I have a trucking company and I have an IoT device on my trucks to tell me where they are and reroute them to the best route, yeah, that's great uh, for that moment. Uh, 
but over the long time, over the long period of time, if I analyze the data from all those trucks in their position, maybe now I can find strategic partnership with the appropriate gas stations to allocate, to provision these trucks the right way. That's, I can't tell the truck, stop, go to this gas station. But if I analyze their route over a period of six months or a year, I know where they're more likely going to go and when to stop and sell gas or not. So those kind of decisions, in my opinion, are the ones that will should be the CEO to consider IoT, whether they just want immediate response or they want long-term predictive response. Okay, we've got another question. How can I use my collected data to my advantage? So I would say my collected data to my advantage. I think this is basically what you're talking about. So uh, I'll let you proceed on that. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about. Now, uh, from from a business perspective, right? IoT. How you? I'm not gonna talk personal because that's uh, that's more. Yeah, that's that's very personalized. The whole how you collect your data, you can do whatever you want with it at that point. It's it's, and I can touch on that too. But to start with the business, using it, I mentioned earlier, it's it's being able to understand to retrend, read trends, uh, predict trends. And, and take action based on that, or be able to immediately rectify actions as they're, being, as they're happening based on live feedback. From a personal side, how can you use it to your advantage? Um, and, and I would say, uh, try to address this to the people that aren't do, going to create the application. They just want to collect, to use the data they're already collecting. Yeah. And, and I know there's some challenges here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just a simple, if we took it on a personal side, how can I take advantage of what this watch is telling me? Um, most, like, for example, we keep track of my heartbeat, uh, my, uh, because I have had the watch on me. And you can analyze my sleep pattern and everything. So one way you can use it to advantage is actually look at that data yourself and see how your heartbeat has been changing throughout the time. Let's look at how your oxygen level is changing. Sick, your stress level, now it's calculating stress. Uh, there's things like uh, you know, Apple right now is working on this thing where it can actually predict mental health based on the usage of the phone. It's, it's a new thing that's happening right now. Just because our phones are piece, a part of us and they know everything about us, um, our providers are trying to tell us about ourselves, things that we don't know. So that's how you could use that data for, for your own good. And, and maybe it will tell you something about yourself that you didn't know. So I've got a follow-up question. Uh, if I've got several devices collecting data, generally they don't all go to the same place, but it would be really valuable if I could collect my sleep data with my medical data with some other data, um, is there, a, do you have a suggestion? And you may not have one, this is the big challenge, but is it, do you have a suggestion on how to collect this into one place? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So there's a simple way and a hard way. The, the hard way obviously would be, hopefully there's somebody who can collect all this data on my behalf, but then we go back to the legislation thing and HIPAA compliance and how much privacy data and who can do it. So I'm sure you knock the door in Silicon Valley today, there'll be 500 startups that will tell you, okay, we'll do that. I think the, uh, the, chat, the just legislative challenge will be unsurmountable. And you have the, the other way, which is how do we do it ourselves? Well. Uh, if you know a little bit about development and data and data and science and all that, you can probably build what we call ETL processes where you can have a data warehouse or, or one centralized location where you get all this data that is of the same, put it in one place, and then you can load it up in a dashboard and read it, uh, Power BI or Tableau, whatever it is. If you are a user who just knows Excel, um, then you can still do that as long as you just use the columns that you need in a format that, that you can read. For example, if you just have, um, if you're collecting data about your, your heartbeat and you get some from your watch, some from your medical provider's history, um, as long as you format that data into just simple two columns, one column date, 
and one other column, heartbeat. If you can just make sure that from whatever you download, you just copy paste just those two items in an Excel sheet and keep track of it. Then over time, those two columns can be converted into a chart. And then you can start seeing the tendencies. That's a very simple way of analyzing how you've been doing over time. Um, it's very manual, might be not that labor intensive, but it does require labor. Okay. So uh, automated, we, we don't have as much as we might want right now. I'm afraid anything that has to do with health, automated, you're dealing with HIPAA and yeah, that's not fun. Yeah. Now, <laughs> The doctors are beginning to get it. Remote patient monitoring is really hot, has become really popular. And even there, the same issue applies, but companies are overcoming it. Uh, but this is data that's going to doctors, uh, making it available to you outside of the, the hospital or the, the doctor's office it is, has a problem with HIPAA. Yeah. and and. and even providing it to the doctor, you really put yourself in, it's another, I don't think, I think it's a wild west there. I don't think there's a law there that regulates how I would allow my doctor to have access to my oxygen level from my wearable watch. And that's a whole different ball game. I mean, obviously somebody will crack it eventually. And when they do, you know, we'll, um, they'll be the, not the pioneers, because the pioneers always take the beating, but it'll be the second years to the pioneers. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll be very successful. But until then, yeah, we still have to deal with the law. Hi, Kareem. Walt, well, this is ET, uh, Emily Troutner. Can I just jump in since I'm a, a clinical yes. researcher and regulatory person, and I was asked to chime in when I can. Um, I, I work with hospitals like Stanford and um, Walt and I go way back, and I also work with the Open Voice Network. The things that you're talking about add another layer of um, remote patient monitoring in that you use the voice, you know, a, a voice print or a, a update reporting, you know, talking to a chat box to, to make sure that you're not having a heart attack, you're taking your meds and things like that. So this is being looked at on the regulatory front. Um, it's just a matter of the privacy and the ransomware that are the, the showstoppers right now. But uh, in Europe, uh, they kind of, the government sets the bar. So people, when they do have uh, post-operative procedures are actually given a Fitbit or some sort of a, a monitor or a glucose monitor. And these things are happening. Um, I also work with the CCPA here in California, which is now a full-blown agency under the attorney general's office and not just an inbox. So they're looking at this hard and fast. So, um, you know, I appreciate everything you're saying and, you know, getting the OSI model to expand through the political and the financial layer. So I like to collaborate with Walt because we look at the issues and actually report to the legislators on what it needs for entrepreneurs like yourself to function and help, uh, you know, all of us in the health community. Um, my goal is to live to be 100 and, you know, have healthy children throughout the pandemic and everything. So this is a big issue. So I appreciate what you're doing and just realize that don't throw your hands up in the air saying, hey, this is what we need to do. And this is how we can make the two things happen. So I appreciate your conversation here and we'll keep in touch with you. Thank you. And, and we have a follow up question. This, this is a good one. If I don't have an internal team. What kind of talent should I be looking for when it comes to developing the software that collects my data in case I want something from scratch? So I, I, this, I don't know if this is somebody who wants to do it for himself or wants to do it for a product, but uh, what do you have to say? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Emily. That, that's very encouraging to know that there's people that are working on this um, from a tech space. You know, we've, that's always been a showstopper and I appreciate you chiming in there. You brought up another point I would like to come back to, which is security. That's gonna be super, super important going forward. But going back to Walt's question, um, look, just like anything, at first it's difficult. There's not a lot of people that know how to do it, but with time it commoditizes and there's gonna be a lot of people that know how to do it. Going back to remember the mobile app days where a lot of there was a lot of web developers and desktop developers, not a lot of people know how to do mobile app. 
Now, a lot of people know how to do mobile. IoT is the same way. Um, <clears throat> you find a strong software development company that, that has ex expertise in developing on IoT, on devices. And at that point, the challenge is not really finding uh, the, right, the, the, the right vendor. The challenge with a lot of projects is really do we, we know exactly what we want that product to do? Do we have a very well-defined product, a well-defined requirement document, a well-defined epics and user stories that we can have developers build for you? Um, but it's the product definition is the most important thing. Um, when it comes to building software, there's a lot of companies, Advanced UOB in one of them, would be more than happy to help with that. Um, but our expertise can only go as far as technical. When it comes to business, we can chime in, but the product has to be very, very well defined and thought of before, and we, before anybody can start working on it. Uh, Karim, 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 I have a quick question here. How can uh, Advantio make all the data collected from IoT more understandable, more up to the tasks? Can you speak a little bit uh, on that while we're on this topic? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, somebody asked earlier, what, um, how can somebody start? And I said, there's boilerplate, but for more expert, for, for people that need larger projects, they need to go with expert, right? So what, how, what kind of expertise have we got? Well, it comes with, number one, don't reinvent the wheel. Now, even as an expert, you don't want to build a cloud collection mechanism where I can go to Azure IoT and then have the mechanism that collects all that data and puts it in one centralized place. Um, so, how, so that's one thing that we can help with. Helping with the tools that will help you get what you desire faster. The second thing is the, the know-how on what to do with that data. Uh, you know, because you've got to collect the data, you've got to transform it, you've got to load it, you got to analyze it. And then after you analyze it, you put it into some kind of machine learning, you try to put some kind of models from it, and uh, that will help build some kind of predictive model that will help you make decisions better. Um, it's just like, um, you know, if let's say you want a rating system on Uber and you want to know, you know, what's more likely to get somebody a five star or a four, or a four star based on parameters, on the driving habits, on the location where they drive the most, whatever it is. So if you really want five star for everything, we can tell you based on your data, if you pick people from Los Angeles, from LAX and drop them off at, um, I don't know, let's say Santa Monica, you're more likely to get two stars because everybody hates the big <laughs> from LAX. But if you were to pick them up from Culver City and drop them off LAX, you're most likely to get a five star. So, you know, once you focus your business, just drop in LAX as opposed to pick up. So, so those are the kind of things we can tell from data and have people focus on. Yeah. So if if I'm a CTO and I'm, I'm wanting to look for IoT developer talent, tell me what that profile would look like. What, what How would you guide my CTO? Yeah. Um, so basically, IoT talent is is just like it depends. Like for example, at Advanced, you know, we don't we hire for expertise, but we hire for you for logic and for smarts. Uh, you can teach people a language, you can't teach them how to think, and uh, and that's the first thing that I recommend any CTO to look for. Don't focus on what they can do today. Focus on the potential that they can bring tomorrow, the day after, and next month. Um, we look for growth mentality, somebody who really, really cares about learning, continuous learning, because this space is changing fast. But, what they know, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what they know today might be relevant to what you need today, but might not be relevant to what you need them for six months from now. Wonderful, so, wonderful. Uh, so, so I know this is a crystal ball question, but typically, what is an IoT project uh, range in time for completion? Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? It, it depends. A lot of a lot of IoT, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of companies that are barely getting into it. So, a lot of it could be just a small MVP that's a matter of weeks, um, and, and you deliver it. But it could be a well thought product that a, an IP product, something that's going to go to the mass public. And then it could, it could take months, even years sometimes to develop IoT products. It depends on the business case. Yeah, so like building from scratch or 
if there are any shortcuts uh, when it comes to software for beginners? Or... Yeah, let's say proof of concept. I just want to make sure to, you know, I want when I open my garage door, a phone rings. Well, you know, it's proof of concept. I can probably do that in a few days and you have a proof of concept. But if you tell me I want that to happen on every single house in America, well, that's a different. <laughs> I got a million of them. I got to put the infrastructure behind it, right? And, and I got to make sure that every home in America is able to use this, and I'm able to do something with that data. So it's the same idea, just different different use changes the the length. <laughs> bravo, bravo! Thank you so much, Karim. Yeah, you're very well. Oh, oh, go ahead and, and continue. Uh, this is very good. So, uh, so everyone in the audience, if you feel uh, compelled to unmute yourself and jump in, this is a, a very interactive uh, part of our, our webinar. And Karim really uh, is, is seasoned, as you can see. He's got a great team behind him. And uh, throw your best shot. Give, him his, give us your, <laughs> your, your detailed questions. We'd love to hear from you. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to talk? Well, maybe you should throw the second best shot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Any more questions typed? Let's see. Um, th this is ET again, Emily Troutner. Um, I, like I said, I'm wrestling with the IoT issues, but I'm also, again, with, I, I really believe that the innovation is that the human body is now being analyzed in so many different ways. Um, you know, with telehealth and decentralized, uh, uh, Walmart is sending me all kinds of health information. You know, we're just getting bombarded. And so everybody is so um, intensely uh, trying to manage your health for you. Uh, insurance companies, like I said, are requiring uh, employee health programs to provide uh, Fitbits or Halos and other wearable devices. Um, and they also dictate to the doctors, you know, what you get paid on uh, if you don't do these things. So it's a, it, it is a paradigm shift. And I think IOT is kind of like that layer in between that's holding all that real world data with the intense medical data that we do need. Um, you know, we have issues with, with seniors and seniors living longer. We have issues with millennials who don't want to go to the doctor's office or don't want to you know, they want their health care instantaneously. And so all of this, I think, is lending a lot of opportunities for IoT in the health and wellness area. So it's a big interest to me. And I hope that you folks will continue to work with uh, Walt and Kareem to, to bring those into fruition. And if you have regulatory battles and all that, there are people and there are agencies who can help. Um, and uh, I, I'm active. Uh, I'm ambassador for the Open Voice Network. We're a global organization, um, part of the Linux Foundation. So we are looking at these challenges and approaching it in different aspects all over the world. So uh, keep doing what you're doing, guys. It's fantastic. Thank you. Karim, can you speak a little bit more on security? I know that you wanted to kind of dive into that just a bit more. Yeah, it's just, it's not just with IoT in general now, it's just Security has been a big issue. Um, a lot of companies have a lot of data and, and they're, you know, every day you hear major companies have been hacked somehow. And, um, and yes, data is a big asset. It tells you a lot about your people or your clients or your market or whatever you want to call it, right? Your population, if you're in, in, in politics, you can tell a lot about your population. You know, if, if I can, to Emily's point, if as a politician, I can get data from uh, health data about my constituents, and maybe I can push for certain projects more than others. Um, and unfortunately, the, the risk with that much data is storage. And when you store something, it's, you know, you could, somebody can snoop on it, into it. Right. And, and, and that's, that's, that's what I was going to touch upon security. It's important when we're doing IoT, uh, we might just want to store, we get, we're gonna get a lot of data, a lot. Uh, and the tendency is we wanna store all of it. The right thing to do is we should only store what's relevant to what we need for our business. And yes, 
we're leaving things on on the table and people say you know what but, but there's money in data why don't you collect all of it yes i can see that but also you, when you do that you're exposing yourself as a vendor or as a provider to to a liability that you might not want to be part of um, that might not be adding any value to your current business process very so interesting can you talk oh. a, a little bit about uh, your case study uh, or a case uh, share a case study that, that uh, you find interesting uh, to the group here or something that was challenging, something that you guys saved the day on? Or um, I mean, we work with a lot of companies. I mean, I can't mention any names, but, but we, we do some work in logistics, for example. And logistics, especially now with the pandemic, you all know there's a huge problem with logistics and getting things from point A to point B. Right. So knowing where your assets are and the loads that need to be carried from what point to what point and immediately being able to suggest the best routes or the type of load that is best, um, that is best for what type of asset to pick up, right? So that if you, if you need to pick up a 20-footer, then you send a 20-footer bed. You don't send a 40-footer bed, things like that. And being able to know what to prioritize and what's not to increase the efficiency of the supply chain, um, that's very, very important. But also using the tools that are heavily readily available because we're in the pandemic, we have to solve the problem today. We don't need to solve it three years from now. So what is it that's out of the box that we can leverage that is enterprise grade that we can do? So. So we have built things uh, that 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 leverages for example, mobile apps for truck drivers that tells knows where they are, what truck they're driving, uh, where the loads are, allows them to pick which one uh, they're they're more comfortable with. Sometimes the loads are different as well, and then rerouting them based on the best optimized route, not just for them but for the whole shipment for them and like fifty or sixty other trucks in the area. And to do that, we have to leverage things like uh, Azure IoT, where Microsoft Gold Partner, so we can actually do a lot on the Azure platform. Uh, we had to leverage uh, the AI for route planning. Uh, we have to leverage even you know when you build software, you don't just build it and deploy it. You you gotta you gotta build it, you gotta test it, you gotta UAT it, then you gotta deploy it. So we built an automated pipeline to do all that stuff to reduce the time to speed to market because when we come up with a new feature, uh, if it's approved today, we got to release it today. We yeah. can't wait for yeah. it like a week to on, on the <laughs> schedule to get it there, right? So those are the kind of things that we did, things like automated testing, things like uh, DevOps pipelines. We're able to do all that, which is your traditional software development lifecycle automated in addition to leverage of IoT um, from, from an actual real, you know, the real world to digital. We're mixing the real world to digital experience. So, so normally based on which technology or languages should we be planning or our interactions with these kinds of gadgets? Honestly, that's a good question that always comes up, not even just, not even in regular development, not even IoT. My answer to that is pick the language that you can find people to do work in. Mm. A lot of companies want to go with languages that are very cool and hip and all that, but then you try to find people to do the work and you can't find anybody. And then the language can support the work, but then if you can't find somebody who can write in that language, then you're just beating yourself up. So I think it's important to go with a stack that people are familiar with. Excellent. Excellent. Karim, it's a pleasure to, to be your host and Bowler Systems encourages everyone here to share a link, uh, uh, your LinkedIn, uh, your invite each other amongst each other. Uh, we are going to also be, we, we're recording this, we'll be reaching back out to each and every one of you. Uh, additionally, anyone who had uh, signed up for the webinar and couldn't make it will also get access to uh, the information here. And most importantly, uh, we'll help you to get directly in touch with Karim and his talented team. We're here to support um, this innovation 
And these guys are solid. They have been doing this for well over a decade. Uh, Karim, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure. Walt, thank you for the opportunity. Now, now I, I want to do some networking. I, I want to give it an opportunity for people to meet each other. Uh, Rio, uh, would you turn off the recording so people are more comfortable sharing? Absolutely. Uh, networking just is- Just a moment. Sure, networking is really important. When, when you lose your job, the best place to go is to your network, to people you know. If you're 